Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Lord, we just want a new picture of you. Well, not a new picture, but an expanded picture of you today, Lord. We just want to see your beauty, your loveliness. And um, more than anything else, we just want to come into your grace. We want to, as the title says, we want to learn and know what it's like to dance with you all the days of our life. And so, Holy Spirit, we just give you the room and we give you the podium. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So, Dancing with the Sun. I had a few other titles at home yesterday. We had Dancing with the Wolves or Dances with Wolves. Dancing with the Stars. It's not that. So this message, uh, so Pastor Dan preached a message two weeks ago called Following Jesus, which I was sitting in my chair. Sometimes you listen to messages and all these other messages just flow out of you when you hear them. And Pastor Dan was doing that a couple of weeks ago and I'm like, obviously realising I was on the roster a couple of weeks' time, thinking, that's it, I'm going to go on the back of that and I can, I've got this and I've got that. And... uh, but it's funny how things change in a couple of weeks' time. And, and so I really love that message. I, I just wanted to applaud that message because I don't know who was here then or who listened to it online, but it was a message about um, following Jesus and, and what that looks like and what it doesn't look like, which was really important in this day and age and in the church because we have um, so many people have a perception of Jesus and so in their walk it's Jesus and a bit of whatever a bit of Muhammad and a bit of new age and a bit of um whatever but it doesn't look like following Jesus and and it's sort of threaded its way into the church and it's become acceptable and we really need we really need those messages that Pastor Dan was talking about you know, all sorts of things that we don't like hearing, you know, like, so, you know, she used words like, you know, denying yourself, funnily, that's a scripture, carrying your cross, you know, that's a scripture, count the cost, that's a scripture, surrender, there's lots of scriptures on that, and and we don't really like that stuff too much, do we? <laughs> because it it's funny, it actually, it, 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 we struggle with it in the flesh, but you'd actually not realise that a lot of the church loves it because it is the flesh. Yeah. I can see some brains ticking over there. See, I loved it when I was in religion because coming from a runner's point of view, I know what it's like to struggle in the flesh. Like you, you give me a hard task and I'll say, well, how can we raise the bar a bit more? in the physical amen because i love the challenge of it that's why i do what i do but god doesn't always want us doing that in christianity but yet all those things are scriptural references to what a walk with christ can look like and we've and so the 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 part of the message this is just a foundation so calm down it's going to get better (laughs) so there this is a message Right, So Jesus said a lot of things which a lot of people actually don't take into account before they make Jesus Christ their Lord and Saviour. He, he did make it really clear. No one goes to war without first counting the cost. Amen? Right? And Jesus had a few messages where he just culled the crowds. What was he trying to do? Because the Bible says he wills that none should perish. He's not trying to get rid of people. He's trying to say to them, this is more than just a surface. You, you can't do this. You can't be my disciple if you're not willing to give everything. He said that, didn't he? If you're not willing to lose your life, you can't follow me. And if you're not willing to put me above every other person in your life, he said these words, these are scriptures. He said, if I'm not first place in your life with everything, you cannot be my disciple. So this is a message. A really good message and a message that church needs right now because we've got so many other things pulling us away of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And it's not a game. 
It's certainly not a game from the other side of the point of view. The enemy doesn't think it's a game. And so we need to know it's not a game in the church. Amen? But this is not where I'm going today. All right? This is not the message that I felt like the Lord shared with me. But let's just keep going on that a little bit. You know, we, that message is, is a little bit like, I can do whatever I want, Jesus. You just fit in with my program, please. Right? That's not following Jesus. Okay? Uh, Jesus is not following us. We follow him. I always, you know, because I find myself doing this a lot over the years. No, Jesus is not our genie in a bottle. I've got a bit of, got a problem over here. <laughs> Can you fix that, Jesus? Right? We all, we all have done that. We all do that. And Jesus is not on our mission. Even Christians think that Jesus is on our mission. <laughs> i got a mission to save the lost. Well, mate, Jesus said, go and clean the laundry. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like you can run your mission your whole life. And it's actually not the mission Jesus has got you on because you're not being led. You're not following him. You're off out doing whatever your thing is. Right? And you get out here and you go, why isn't this working? Why is this so hard? Why is there not much fruit? Or maybe there is a lot of fruit. What you think is fruit. And then Jesus goes, it's all wood, straw and hay. Just saying. Just a thought. Amen? Jesus revolves around my life. Not my life revolves around Jesus. These are all little things to get Jesus back into the central focus of where he needs to be in our life. Because quite easily, we can subconsciously put Jesus in those places in our life. And that's why that message that Pastor Dan had is so important, because we need to get the right picture of who he should be in our life. Like when I came to Jesus, I know everyone's different, but when I came to Jesus, I knew what I was doing. I knew... Well, no, I didn't really. <laughs> Tell a lie. No one does. It's like when you get married. Yes, I'll love you forever. Through goodness and hardness, sickness and poor. And then we do our best, especially blokes. Blokes have no idea. <laughs> but, but what I did know, what I did know was that I had to lay down everything that I had made my life on up to that point. Like, I, I mean, I was over my life at that point anyway with what I'd done with it, what I'd experienced. I didn't really want that life anymore anyway. The challenge with this, that message, right, which, is, which I've just said is an amazing message and needs to be preached regularly, the challenge with that message is that it's very easy subconsciously if you think if you if you sense your hearts right now to come in to condemnation and guilt because you have you haven't made the mark maybe you haven't laid your life down enough maybe you haven't counted the cost maybe you are doing things that aren't being led by God maybe you think that he isn't really your savior right so you start to get all these doubts about you know so so what you do then is you go back more into the flesh, I've got to do more. I've got to lay my life down more. I've got to deny myself more. I've got to pray more. I've got to surrender more. I've got to be a better husband. I've got to be a better this. I've got to be a better that. I've got to do more this and do more that. And now you're right over here where Jesus absolutely doesn't want you. But you think that's the message because that's the message in the Scriptures. So where are we going with all this? <laughs> The point is, there's a much better way to do our walk. And hopefully, that's why I was excited about this message, we'll be able to share it. Rather than being under law in your walk with God, you must deny me, you must surrender, you must count the cost, you must lay down your life. Why don't we just let God, Jesus, lead us by grace 
and let him direct the paths of our life and let him empower us to do what we're called to do. Wouldn't that be a much better idea? This is the way I feel like the Lord gave it to me to look at. Your life can look like a dance with the greatest lead ballroom dancer ever. Amen. This is a beautiful picture of what our life should look like with Jesus as our lead ballroom dancer. Now, I don't know a lot about ballroom dancing. I have a cousin who had an amazing career as a ballroom dancer and, you know, got to the highest point that he could possibly get to in the amateur ranks and then went professional. But what I do know, and I did Google a little bit, is that, you know, the male in the, in the dance routine has a role and that role is to lead, isn't it? I think that's 99% of the times he's leading the dance and it's the female's role to respond and react. Amen? But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, and we're not getting into roles of who's domineering over who here, right? Please. Hey, I haven't finished my message yet. The point is, who is it that actually gets the glory from the dance? It's the lady. Everyone looks at the lady. Well, the blokes do. <laughs> right? It is, isn't it? Like, we, we, we know the blokes there, right? But who is it getting thrown up in the air? Who is it going down like this? Right? Who's doing this? You know, it's not the bloke. But yet everything is under his leading. Amen? And you know what? I believe that Jesus is securing himself enough to want his bride so to look beautiful. Amen? He's not an insecure man. He's not an insecure leader. He's actually happy for you, you know, to get some glory for your life because it brings him glory. Didn't Jesus say, I've glorified you just as you've glorified me? This is the whole thing. This is the point. All right. So for the blokes, <laughs> so you've got to balance it up a bit here. Ooh, come on, Dane. Ooh. Do you play rugby union, Dane, or league? Or League. I want you on my side, mate. Don't want you running at me. Uh, anyway. So for the blokes, this is a great analogy again. I love this. It's so beautiful. You can look at Jesus like the greatest horse whisperer there ever has been. Amen. And, what, and if you do any, and I have done a little bit of study, looking into horse whispering, there's a couple of ways you can do it. And there is the way where you just break the horse down, right, to where it's got nothing left, to where it obeys you. That's the law, right? But if you're actually a person who cares about the animal and you actually want to get better results, there's a way where the whole point of being the horse whisperer is to build trust with that animal that you're not going to hurt it. Because 99% of the time, those horses can't be broken in because they've either been broken in wrongly the first time and now they're so fearful and angry and you, they can't get near another human being or anyone who looks like they're in authority and they can't be broken in unless they go to these people who build trust with the animal. Amen. And then all of a sudden you've got this beautiful relationship again. You've got this huge beast, which it's okay to think of yourself as powerful. You know, horses are 800 kilos, beautiful running animals. But yet with the right horse whisperer, it takes a tiny tap on the rein and that whole animal, this is in James, isn't it? Remember the, the bit, the bridle? That whole animal will move exactly where you want it. That's you. That's us. That's us under grace. We are led. See, this is the whole point about following Jesus. We are led of the Lord. We don't lead the Lord. He leads us. <laughs> Just saying. So, so 
So I thought of this. Who, some of you probably weren't even born, who uh, liked the movie Dirty Dancing? Have you seen that, Sarah? Sarah hasn't seen any movies from the 80s. She hasn't seen Top Gun yet. You have to see Top Gun. You know, you know how much of God is in Top Gun? It's unbelievable. I could, I could do a whole sermon on Top Gun. No, no, it's, it's, I will one day. <laughs> or maybe not a whole sermon. But what, what we love about that movie, right, apart from all the other stuff, you know, whatever, but what we love about that movie is we love that the lady in that, in that movie is called Baby, right? She steps in for the lady who was the actual ballroom dancer and under Patrick Swayze's amazing guide as a dancer yeah. and under his care and under his whatever you want to say, he brings the best out of Baby. And all of a sudden, Baby, who was this gangly little, you know, immature teenager who didn't know much about life, is now this amazing, confident dancer living her best life. Amen? Isn't this beautiful? This is what Jesus does with our life. This is what he wants to do with our life. It's called dancing with Jesus. Amen? So let's just get some Bible in here. <laughs> Let's have a look at this. I really feel like the Lord's given me a few different things on these scriptures, which is what he does. So let's just do 12 first, Jim. So therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Just hold it there. I believe that what that's saying there, we're debtors, we are debtors not to the flesh, is that whenever you're under the law, you're living in the flesh. I know that we could take that as the flesh, as in if you look at the lists of flesh in Galatians, but I really believe that when you're in your own strength and in your own works and you're trying to do this thing on your own, you're under the law and you're in the flesh, right? So this scripture is saying we're debtors no more to the flesh. In other words, we don't owe the law anything. We don't have to live under the law anymore. It's been paid. We are no longer debtors. Before we had a debt, we owed God everything. He said, this is the law, this is the commandment, this is the standard you need to live by to appease me, which none of us could keep. All right? 13. For if you live after the flesh, if you live in your own strength... If you live leading Jesus and not being led by Jesus, right, you will die. This is why so many Christians are burnt out, tired, can't do the walk, don't turn up to church. Things aren't working for me. Christianity sucks. Am I allowed to say that? It's a bunch of do's and don'ts, moral decrees, and it's not working for me. It isn't working for you because you're in the flesh, not being led, and you're dying spiritually and physically. Amen? But if through the Spirit, in other words, you're led by the Spirit, you're being led like the ballroom dancer, what's going to happen? Your life is going to live. You shall live. Is there one more scripture? Yes, 14. This is the key. For as many that are led, that means Jesus has to be in front of you. You can't be in front of Jesus. If you are led by the Spirit of God, now you come into truly what it's meant to be, what Jesus died for, your true sonship, and daughtership of God. But it only happens by being led. It doesn't work any other way. Amen. See, the law, or you could say the flesh, right, doing things in your own strength, appeasing God in your own actions, is based in fear. 
It is. Fear of, if I don't do this, if I don't act this way, if I don't respond in this situation like this, I'm not meeting a certain criteria that God needs me to meet. And then you're going to feel condemnation and you're going to feel judgment. That's what walking in the flesh is like. You're under the law and you're dying. And we've got a whole church that is under the law and wondering why it's not taking the nations for Jesus and wondering why people don't want to join it. And Jesus said, you cannot put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, you negate both. So you, got not, you haven't got the strength of the law working for you because the law is a schoolmaster to bring you to salvation. So that's not working for you. And, you can't, and grace is not working for you because you're still under the law. And grace, the Bible says, teaches you to deny ungodliness. It's grace that teaches you to walk away from the world and walk away from the attractions of the world. So you got neither. And this is what Jesus is saying. Both of them are deluded and it's, you just throw it all out. Just throw it out. Start again. Go back under the law. That's why the Bible says let people go back out into the world and into under sin so they come to a place where they go, this ain't working either. This is terrible. It's called the prodigal son. Don't stop them. Let them go. It's really hard to do. I've got kids. <laughs> they don't do that, but it happens all the time. So we want to live. And the way to live fully in God is to be Led. See, it doesn't negate that message. I can guarantee you, you're still going to be carrying a cross. See, why does, why does God want obedience? I mean, you know, he does want obedience. Like he, he asked for it in the, in the old covenant and he asked for it in the new covenant. So what's the big deal for obedience with God? He doesn't want chocolate soldiers. He's not looking for chocolate soldiers, <laughs> you know? Yeah. He knows that the obedience under him or being led by him leads to prosperity for his children. And obviously there's other things that come with that, kingdom building, salvation of souls. But the bottom line is, when you get to the nuts and bolts about God, God's relationship is all about you, first and foremost, before you even look outside your window. It's all about you. This is why he can have his eye on you and you alone and you feel like the centre of the universe, but yet his eye is on seven billion other people. But when you, when you come into the presence of God, you will know that he doesn't have any other interest in the world except for you. And you're the apple of his eye. That's what the scripture says. Amen? So, so his, his whole thing is about, like any parent, we want our child to obey us because it leads to blessing and prosperity. I teach my ch children moral characteristics and what's right and wrong because I want them what? Because I know what's going to help them prosper in life. If you keep doing this, this is not going to go well for you, son. If you keep doing this, this is not going to go well for you, daughter. I know. Right? God knows. That's what it's all about. So he was trying to do that in the old covenant, but, we, but man put themselves under that old covenant, something they could never keep. But there was nevertheless, there were still promises in the old covenant. Have a look at Deuteronomy 28. Just read the first part. Don't go to the second part. <laughs> If you do this, you'll get this, right? That's not a bad deal, but if you don't. But God never wanted us under that. See, grace or the dance of grace is a response from, listen to this, this is really important. This is, these are the foundations. If you will keep these as the foundations of your Christian walk, you will always prosper. Amen? This is a four-step prosperity message. <laughs> <laughs> Ten steps to success. Ten steps to getting the prophetic gift. Five steps to speaking in tongues. Fifteen steps to walking out your call with Jesus. <laughs> but these, these ones are really from God. So, <laughs> Okay. Grace, or the dance of grace, if you want to call it that, 
is a response. Remember, it's a response. You respond. The reason why you're responding is because Jesus is leading you. You're not responding if you're out in front of him. You're leading, right? So the dance of grace is a response to, listen, love received. Not just love. Love received. You can talk about the love of God till the cows come home. Until you've received the love of God, nothing changes in your life. Even the devil knows God is love. He can read the scriptures. Right? Love received is the first thing. Received. Second thing, trust developed. You must have a relationship like the horse whisperer where you trust the leader. And you don't trust him if you're afraid of him. Right? Because perfect love, which was the first one, casts out all fear. You can't trust someone that you're afraid of. I'm sorry. There is a message called the fear of the Lord, and it's a good message, and it's important, and it needs to be preached. It's a bit similar to the first part of the message I was talking about. But if you don't get these right, you'll never walk in the proper fear of the Lord. Being accepted. You must know that you're accepted in the beloved. It's the righteousness message. You know, I was having a bad day through the week this week. Funny that. Imagine that, having a bad day. <laughs> Is that possible? A minister? Please. Probably have more bad days. Anyway, but a song came on. It's a beautiful song that Bethel's singing at the moment. It's called The Blood. What's that song? Alleluia. Alleluia. Only by the blood. It's only blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I won't do it any justice. That's it, right? And it is. It is. And that's God speaking to me saying, Tony, what are you doing? What are you, how are you trying to appease me? What are you trying to make right with me? You can't do it anyway. It's by, done by one thing. That red stuff dripping out of my son on a cross 2,000 years ago is the only thing you can appease me with. Come on. And you know what? All the weight just comes off my shoulders. Oh, I forgot, Lord. It's not about my actions. It's not about my performance. It's not about whether I did good or did bad today. Right believing leads to right living. It's one of the most powerful things that Joseph Prince ever quoted amongst many others. But it's so true. What you believe directs your life. Isn't it? Guard your heart, for out of it comes life. So what you believe here, this is the governor of your life. What you believe about yourself, what you believe about God, what, what you believe about how he sees you is how you live your life. Oh, I forgot, Lord. It's not about me. It's about what you did. And then right believing leads to right living, which is what we all want. But we're doing it back to front. We're putting ourselves back under the law to do what we can't do. That's heavy rain. Is anyone liking this message? Oh, stop it. I can tell when you're just appeasing me. So, I mean, I use this as an example. Like, I don't try to manifest anything anymore from God. So one of the things, you know, which is, is, is big for us, and, and it's, it's so true for us, you know, forgiveness, right? Forgiveness is huge because we've just got a world that is so beat up and beating others up and beats us up. And it's, it's something that, you know, you're going to walk into every day of the week. And if you want to have a, a clear conscience and, and a clear pathway with God, and if you want to be able to hear from God, you really need to work yourself into a place of forgiveness of anyone and everyone who's ever wounded you or hurt you in your life. And then once you've done that, just get ready for tomorrow because it's going to happen again tomorrow. But what I never try to do, so what I will do is I will start in the law because the Bible says to forgive, right? 
So I will start under the commands of Jesus, but I don't want to stay there. Like I don't want to just pray a prayer, Lord, I forgive them, Lord, bless them. But I never, ever want to see that person again or want to hear that person's name or go anywhere near that person. That to me is not wholeness, right? I want God and I'm waiting now, I'm waiting to respond for his empowerment to give me a picture of that person, of how he sees them, so I can truly forgive them. Oh, the weight, the weight off my shoulders. It's just the best. It's the best life. But I'm not trying to manufacture it in myself. I'm not trying to make myself forgive someone. I'm just doing what the Lord says. And now I'm saying, now, Lord, I need you. I, want to, I need to respond to you. And this is what the Lord did with me recently about a situation that I knew I was still in knots about and tied up about. And he showed me a picture of himself on the cross. It was here in worship. And I've actually never seen this before. I've made up some pictures in my head, but this wasn't in my head. This is coming out of my spirit. And I saw the Lord on the cross and he was in great travail. How do you know that? How do you know when someone's in great travail? You're not there. You can't see them. You're not touching it. It's, you can sense it in the spirit that he's in great travail, great pain. And then I sensed that, that at that moment, the Lord was taking upon him, on his body, my sins for my life. Mate, that will, ta- that will take away any animosity you have towards anyone else. And this is the point. Because you've been forgiven, we forgive. But until you realise you've been forgiven, it's very hard to forgive someone else. It's not to put yourself under guilt and condemnation. There was no guilt and condemnation in that vision. Nothing but beautiful freedom. Oh, Lord, I missed it. I missed it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. But that's a response to grace. I'm not running out in front of Jesus going, I've got to forgive, I've got to forgive, I've got to forgive. That'll kill you. That's what, that's what Romans is talking about. You will die. Don't do that. Just be real with God. I can't forgive this person for what he's done to me. Two minutes, five pages left. All right. (laughs) Okay, so if law is about doing and grace is about responding and following is about being led, what as Christians do we need to be doing more of? This This is a trick question. No, it's not really. If law is about doing and grace is about responding and following is about being led, what do we need to be doing more of as Christians? I'll give you the answer. What were you going to say, Pastor Kim? Yes, it's it's in the same vocabulary. Waiting. Waiting. Now, people hate that. Because you think, oh, nothing's going to get done. It's true, right? And it's different for everyone. It's different for everyone. But we don't get this. So I listened to a message recently from Erwin McManus. Could have been anyone saying it. But he said the hardest thing for Christians to do in this world, in this life now, is to wait upon the Lord. (laughs) Because we've got so many things pulling us every which way, everywhere, to be attracted to. But yet the Bible is full of wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. You know, the Lord said to me, I woke up one morning, eight, nine years ago, bolt upright in bed, and I heard in my spirit, tarry ye. Tarry ye, use the King James Version. <laughs> right? Didn't know God was so religious. <laughs> Tarry, you know what? I'm still actually waiting for that word to come to pass. I don't even know what that means. I know what it means, but you know what I mean? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Wait upon the Lord. Linger, ponder, listen, tarry ye, rest, right? Because you can't be led. Now, I know what your brains are going. Your brains are ticking over time. 
how is anything going to get done if I just sit on the couch and wait for the Lord all day? <laughs> right? You, we've all got things to do. We've got problems to solve, people to see, places to go, programs, calendars, events, dates, right? Down to the minute. It's a, it's a relationship with the lead dancer. Amen? He has the reins of my heart. It's all, see, this is why Christianity is so different to every other thing, if you want to call it that. It's about a relationship. And, and if you don't have a relationship or if you haven't built this in, you won't have the intimacy to hear from the Lord the way he wants us to interact with him. Pastor Dan just said everyone is prophetic. That's right. You know why? Because Jesus said you were. He said, my sheep hear my voice. He didn't say some of you are prophets and only hear. Like, don't get me wrong. There is an office for the prophet. And Pastor Dan has that office, right? But that's different to you. we all are supposed to hear from the Lord. Amen? Why? Because he wants to lead you. <clears throat> See, can we just put up that scripture, uh, one Corinthians fifteen ten? I'm going to land this plane because we're out of time. Like, I know we know these scriptures, but let's just, before we read that, let's just remember that famous scripture in Isaiah, wait upon the Lord. And then what, is, what happens after you've waited upon the Lord? I will renew your strength. And what is the result of that? You will run and not be weary. We are running and we are weary because we never did the first part. Yeah? And it's a, it's a continual coming back. See, Rick, Pastor Rick preaches about this all the time. It's a continual coming back to the place of where you are strengthened. See, what, what is the whole analogy about Mary and Martha? We, we know the analogy. See, I, I believe that the way the Lord wants us to transition. See, Martha was doing the right thing at the wrong place, right? Martha's serving the Lord before she'd heard the word. And Jesus said, no, Mary has chosen the right part. And see, after you've heard the word, you become like Isaiah. You hear the word and now you've run, you're running with strength, right? It wasn't that Jesus was bagging Martha. Martha has a part to play. It's just that she got the first part wrong first. Amen? Now Mary, you know what's going to happen? Mary is going to, be, going to become a Martha. Isn't she? She is because you're all looking confused. So we better go here. <laughs> this is Paul. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Covenant. Paul is the preacher of grace. Paul is the one who was admonishing Christians to be killed. He's like the ISIS of the day. He, he had a great revelation of what he was transformed from to. So he said this, but the grace of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And it's his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Why was his grace not in vain? This, this is a big statement. I wouldn't say this in front of you. I wouldn't go to you guys and say, I've laboured more than all of you. <laughs> you reckon I might get a bit of kickback? <laughs> what about if I said it to the church? I've laboured more than all the church. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> well, I'm not, lucky no one's got my email. Yeah, tomatoes are coming, deluxe. But this is what Paul said. Why did Paul say this? But I laboured more abundantly than they all. Who's he talking about? He's talking about all the other disciples. Peter, John, who's the rest of them? <laughs> I haven't read the Bible lately. <laughs> Was there a James? 
Why? Why has he laboured more? Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And see, grace is a response. I'm just going to I'm just going to share one more thing. Quick, someone sing a song. Are we are we getting? Is, is there a picture here somewhere? Are we getting a picture here? That following Jesus is to be led. And it's not denying the other message because you will go to a cross. <laughs> you will. And you will be denying yourself because the more you look like Jesus, the more you'll walk his walk. Amen? But we don't want to do it in our own strength. We don't want to die. We want to be alive. We want to be live Christians, happy Christians, joyful Christians, <laughs> you know? Okay, let's finish. I'm going to finish on something. See, who knows these scriptures, but they're all in line with this. We live out of acceptance, not for acceptance. We live out of acceptance because you're accepted. That's where your power comes from. Right? We live out of victory, not for victory. Sons and daughters are led. Orphans and slaves lead. It's true. They do. They, they make their own way. They run their own path. They do their own thing. This is exactly what Pastor Dan was saying. Jesus is not, they are not following Jesus. And we've got to get out of orphan mentality and slave mentality. And you've got to get out of the old covenant in that way. The Old Covenant has got lots of great things for us to learn. That's what the Bible says. But it's not what we're under anymore. And we've got to get out of it because we are killing the New Covenant. Yeah. Right? You cannot put old wine into new wineskins. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Uh, who's coming up? Anyone coming up? Pass then. Amen. Praise the Lord.